So I spent a week in Hell's Canyon and didn't get any video or photos that were worthwhile. But I did start overheating a bit, so I had to take the uh, heat exchanger apart on this 6.2 DI engine. And as a consequence, I have a few observations that I'd like to share. Uh, so the way this thing works is the uh, water from the engine, let's call this the antifreeze, it comes this way and into the heat exchanger here. And then it comes back out right down here. You can see this, this guy right here, so it comes out right there. So that tells me that it's the, the uh, antifreeze is actually making two passes through the heat exchanger. It heads down to the end that way, then turns around and comes back here. It has to do that, you know, otherwise if it just went from here to here, then, then it, you know, wouldn't be cooling at all. So it has to be two passes for the antifreeze. Okay, so now we're going to look uh, at where the cooling water, the river water actually comes in. So it comes in here and comes up here and then goes through this oil cooler. The oil cooler presumably is one pass. And so you've got your two uh, oil pressure or oil lines here. Then uh, water comes out of the oil cooler and up into the heat exchanger here. So that's, that's your river water coming in. Then the river water passes all the way through this guy and then it exits out, out these two things. One of these hoses goes over there to the uh, exhaust, then it gets dumped into the exhaust and heads, heads back into the river. And the other one comes this way and it does the same thing. It heads down into the river. Now it's common knowledge that this heat exchanger is supposedly self-draining. And when you look at it at first glance from the outside, that would appear to be true. Uh, the, the top of the heat exchanger is here, and then you can see it actually slopes downward. So that's a deliberate design, so it slopes downward. So when you turn the, uh, when you turn the engine off, then the water is going to drain out of it that way, down through the uh, oil cooler and out into the river. And then you'll end up with no water inside the heat exchanger. But it turns out that's not true. And uh, so we could say that the heat exchanger is self-draining but only conditionally. So uh, I'm going to take it apart here and, and show you what actually is inside the heat exchanger. So here I've taken the end caps off. It's really easy to do. Uh, there's 9 16 and, and a screwdriver to pop the cap off. And then there's a rubber gasket inside. And uh, you'll note, interestingly, that this gasket is asymmetric and that is actually very important. So now I'll see if I can get the uh, I'm going to go look inside the engine compartment. I think this is still recording. Okay, so now I'm looking at the intake end of the, uh, or the river water inlet on the uh, heat exchanger. So here it comes from the, uh, the oil cooler and then comes into the heat exchanger. You can see it comes in right here. And it comes into this space right here. And I don't know if you can see, but this space is disconnected from this from the bigger space up here. So so the, these two things are isolated. Uh, so that means that the river water can only head down through the, these tubes uh, through the heat exchanger. The rest of these tubes, their, their river water isn't accessing from this point. Okay, so the river water flows down these tubes. I think it's the, the bottom four rows of tubes. And then comes down here. Okay, now we're at the other end. And here we're at the other end. And I better get this light so we can see what's going on. Okay, now with the light. Now you can see what happens here. Okay, the uh, bottom four rows, uh, they're going to come out here into this plenum. And, uh, and again, this area right here, this is one. This is one common area. So the uh, water is going to come in the bottom here, and then it's going to turn around and go back down the tubes this way. And uh, you can kind of see that. Some of these tubes are kind of gunked up. So what happens is water comes shooting out of those tubes, it brings a little bit of gunk with it, and then it tries to head back down these tubes, and the gunk just kind of backs up here for some reason. So when I've taken this apart, 
Uh, both times I've taken it apart, I found that there's actually uh, quite a bit of gunk here at the turnaround, okay? So it turns around and heads back down this way. And again, uh, this, uh, this compartment up here is completely separate from this compartment. Okay, so the river water heads that way. Okay, now we'll head back down the other end. And here we are at the other end of the engine again. And uh, so now we're looking at the uh, bigger compartment. So the water comes out of this uh, mi middle set of tubes in the bigger compartment here. Then it turns around and heads back down that way in the top three rows. Okay, so it's heading back down that way. And here we are looking at the top three rows. Okay, now if we can get a, get a light in there. Okay, we're looking at the top three rows. The water comes in there. And then it heads out these hoses. So from this top uh, compartment, then it heads out uh, each one of these to the exhaust. So that's how it works. So this is a three pass uh, cooler on the river water side. So the inside of those tubes, it makes three passes. And that, that has interesting implications. One is that because this whole thing is sloped, that it's sloped downward, you know, so it's sloped down from here to here, there's actually a low spot at this end where water will accumulate. So it's going to accumulate in the bottom of this uh, upper compartment. So uh, the only way you'll get all the water out of this thing is to drive up and down hills so that the um, heat exchanger tips up and down and then maybe the water will get out of the bottom. Otherwise, it, it just won't. If this was a single pass heat exchanger, then uh, the external assumption that you might make looking at it from the outside, um, then, then, it, then it would be fine. You know, the whole thing would reliably drain when you turn the engine off, but because the three pass, it doesn't. Now there's another interesting thing about a three pass is it will be less e effective at cooling the, uh, the engine. So the river water, uh, you want that to be as cold as possible and to, for maximum cooling. And the way you make it as cold as possible is to have maximum flow through there. And by having three passes, that's kind of a, a defeating part of the purpose here. It's kind of like if you want, uh, if, if you put three garden hoses side by side and one, and, and then you have another garden hose that's three times as long as those, which one is going to have the maximum flow? The three side by side is a really long one that's only the size of one of those. You know, obviously you're going to have a lot less flow, uh, so the river water will heat up a lot more, and as it heats up, then it becomes less effective at cooling the, uh, the antifreeze. So, uh, so the, this, uh, this design is certainly interesting. It seems to work when uh, the, the tubes are unobstructed, but uh, it could be better. And then as I pointed out, uh, the glop tends to accumulate on this side. And so, you know, if you see that, well, you know, only say 10 of the tubes are, are clogged, well, that's 10 of the tubes going in one, one of the passes. It's not 10 of all the tubes. So if you were to have a few tubes plugged, say at the, at the very inlet side or at the inlet to the, the third pass, which is actually uh, quite restricted. There's not very many tubes in there. Um, if you had a, an obstruction at either of those, then the, the flow would be knocked down even more than you might, might guess. Uh, so anyway, uh, something to do that would uh, make this whole thing better uh, would be to just uh, cut out this wall right here. So you, know, you could just cut into this wall and then uh, it would become a one-pass heat exchanger, and you'd have to do that at both ends. Um, yeah, but, you know, cutting into that, you know, without taking the thing apart isn't going to be easy. I don't feel like doing it because uh, I, I'm planning, well, how do I keep, keep gunk out of this? Well, I will just put in a sand trap, which will which I will actually refer to as a debris trap because sand seems to just blast right on through this thing. I don't see any evidence of sand in here, but there is uh, various goop and glop that tends to uh, accumulate. So it will be called a debris trap. And because it will be trapping a lot of debris, presumably, uh, it will need to be pretty big. Otherwise, it will just clog off 
and uh, then I'll be overheating because the debris trap is clogged. So there you have it. In summary, this uh, heat exchanger is uh, not necessarily self-draining. Uh, if you want to uh, make sure that it's drained for the winter, drive up and down a whole lot of hills, or you can just uh, um, remove the cap at the low end, which is at the back end. And then the, uh, um, this heat exchanger could be more effective if it was a single pass on the river water side. I haven't really thought too much about the two pass on the antifreeze side. Um, th th there may be a good reason for that. Uh, the river water part, you want that to be single pass to get maximum effectiveness and uh, that keeps the river water coolest and maximizes heat transfer and that will be best at cooling your engine.